So I normally don't discuss history much on this channel because when I do, people just seem to tune out. This is one of my least watched videos. I elaborated on history in the last third of my video about single motherhoods and critics seem to have poor comprehension skills and in other cases just flat out ignored everything I said. One dude literally asked me about the history of women making poor life decisions as a counter argument. But I felt an urge to make this video because there are too many ahistorical narratives the manosphere spews to legitimize contemporary gripes, and some of them are just misleading and or off the wall. Back in the day, back in like the, the mid-1800s, all the way up to 1920, when they ratified the 19th Amendment, the suffragists were seen as terrorists. They were bombing churches. They were planning political assassinations. They were very, uh, they're very white supremacist back then. Um, and on I mean, there's so much that was going on with that movement that if we were to take those women today and put them in today's society, they'd be part of Antifa right now. Mm -hmm. And we wouldn't think twice about like associating them with them. You had birth of a nation, which by the way, I consider to be a historically accurate film. One of my favorite films, but birth of a nation also tried to warn America about this Negro of which many people considered the birth of a nation racist. They said, this is a racist film, the way it depicted black people. They said, this is racist, but yet and still it tried to warn me. Now, when we view the Negro in 2015, we would have to admit that those pro-slavery advocates and Mr. Griffith, the, the, the creator of birth of a nation, were not racist. They were in fact prophets. The first clip was Rollo Tomasi claiming that the women's suffrage movement was a hate movement, but omitted that those terroristic actions occurred in Great Britain and Ireland between 1912 and 1914. And a campaign for voting rights, equal pay for equal work, and anti-rape activism had nothing to do with hating men and cannot be placed into the same category as paramilitary groups such as the KKK, Red Shirts, and Knight of the White Camellia that emerged after the Civil War to reinstall white democratic control in the South. Male opposition against women's suffrage often came from a perceived assault on masculinity. As 19th century historian Francis Parkman said, quote, To give the suffrage to women would be to reject a principle that has thus far formed the basis of civilized government. The head of the family is the political representative of the rest. The second clip was from David Carro, who claimed that the 1915 film Birth of a Nation was an accurate historical representation of Reconstruction. Yes, a film with horrific racial imagery is his favorite film of all time. Not only is this claim inaccurate, but it's how Reconstruction was taught for the majority of the 20th century. Although W.E.B. Du Bois challenged the Dunning School narrative that Reconstruction failed because radical Republicans gave blacks too much political power and they were not quote unquote ready for democracy, he was largely ignored by contemporary scholars. The Dunning School gets its name from Columbia University historian William Archibald Dunning and his students who cast white Southerners as benevolent and were taken advantage of by white Northerners. Blacks in this historiography were largely invisible, but when mentioned they were portrayed as ignorant people who had a propensity to behave irrationally. You must understand that contemporary times shape how history is analyzed for better and for worse. The Dunning School, as historian Eric Foner explained, was the edifice of the Jim Crow system and justified stripping voting rights away from blacks and made white southerners comfortable with the status quo. But the larger picture of Tomasi and Carroll's statement was their attempt to give legitimacy to contemporary gripes that feminism has been anti-male from its exception. And in Carroll's case, blacks are incapable of self-governance. Unfortunately, I'm not shocked that these inaccurate historical claims and others that I'll get into go unchecked. Unlike social science, which almost everybody on YouTube pretends to have mastery over, history is a book-based discipline. You're not going to just do a quick Google search on something, read an abstract, and place it into your arsenal of studies. It doesn't work that way. Others cite one primary source but have no idea how to analyze it. Harker Tito tried this on me and deleted the post once I explained the proper historical context of ex-slave testimonials. 
I assume that this interest in history boils down to the fact that the average person isn't going to read seven books on the same subject to argue a point. Sure, anyone can reference a documentary they watch, a book, or an internet article, but possess no understanding of historiography and how to construct a historical argument. That's not to say that you have to have a thorough understanding of a subject to recognize dubious claims, but documents like the Monaghan Report cannot be understood thoroughly by listening to avatars on YouTube. Some claims don't require a deep understanding of American history to realize how disingenuous the arguments are. Men right activists try to appropriate the murder of Emmett Till by comparing it to false allegations in the Me Too era and claim they represented why we cannot believe all women, which totally eradicates the core racial element of the case and the fact that white men who sexually assaulted black women couldn't be charged because racial discourse held the belief that black women couldn't be raped because of their supposed lascivious nature. If you followed my old channel, you likely saw videos where I showed clips of men making inaccurate and ahistorical claims that aren't even worthy of dissecting, but I'll list them for you if you want a good laugh. Black women rejected the talented temp and called them educated lame, said that they talk white, as well as overlooked them because they were blue collar. Carroll stated this, but apply YouTube terminologies and talking points to a historical time period where such terms aren't applicable, and provided no evidence that such interactions even occurred. Margaret Sanger supported the extermination of black people and supported Hitler. If you were, if you research Planned Parenthood, Margaret Sanger, if you research her original reason to have birth control in the black community, it was to exterminate and limit the amount of black people that were up, uh, children that were being born. Both which are myths and the former is a primary source available at Smith College that is grossly misquoted. Calling the Democratic Party the party of white supremacy after the Civil War, but ignoring the shift in political allegiances over the course of the 20th century. Calling the second iteration of the KKK and the rise of Jim Crow progressivism, which is not the definition of progressivism. Progressives believe people's circumstances could improve based off their environment and were redeemable. Granted, they didn't view black people as redeemable or worthy of intervention, but that's another topic for another day. Black women call 20th century military conflict, including World War One and Two. If a black woman would have kept her mouth shut back then, you would not be having World War One or World War Two. Fun fact, when I asked the dude was he serious, he said yes and then blocked me. Black women regularly thought at slave rebellions. Nobody as yet has provided any evidence to back up this dubious claim. Mandingo fighting was real as depicted in the film Django. There's no evidence that slave owners wouldn't have taken that sort of risk since it would have been an economic loss. The Haitian Revolution and that Turner Rebellion were quasi-SYSBM movement. This is just stupid. Sexual relations between black women and white slave owners were not only consensual, but that black women enjoyed it. Again, there's no evidence in the idea that a person held in bondage against their will willingly reproduced where the slave owner downplayed the exploitative power dynamic. Harriet Tubman didn't exist. <laughs> the female scientists characterized in the film Hidden Figure were fictional. Black men who married interracially before 11 vs. Virginia were SYSBM. The gynocracy murdered Tupac Shakur. Black women went to the KKK to get black men lynched. Feminism led to the decline of the Black Panther Party. Women are one of the cause of the fall of the Roman Empire. Those examples are really just scratching the surface. You have content creators who misuse academic texts to back up dubious historical claims and analysis. For years, BGS Ipmore cited Daughters of the Trade, which cover five generations of interracial marriages along the Gold Coast of Africa. Him and others cited it to argue that black women willingly conspired to have sex with white men during the slave trade to the detriment of black men. Even titling a now deleted video called The Original Swirlers, I took the time to read a book and contacted the author to get a response. She called the argument ridiculous and didn't even think it was worthy of engaging with. Let's look at the Monaghan Report because everybody on YouTube is supposedly an expert on this document. Authored by Daniel Patrick Monaghan, he seemed like an unlikely contender to discuss African American issues. Born in 1927, Monaghan experienced a comfortable middle class lifestyle, but unlike contemporary news accounts that interviewed him in the 1960s, he only fell out of that social economic bracket at the end of the Great Depression when his father, an alcoholic, abandoned his family in 1937. This detail is important because sympathetic press account portrayed him as an intellectual authority about African Americans and as a person who could relate to their plight since he rose out of poverty, was raised by a single mother, and faced discrimination as an Irish Catholic. Never mind the fact that Irish Catholics could opt to identify with their whiteness. 
It's also important to note his background because it informed why he believed that a strong male breadwinner was a crucial cause in social inequality. The Black Manosphere loves to reference the text because it gives intellectual legitimacy to its gripe that female-headed households had impended Black progress since the passage of the civil rights legislation. The report claimed problems endured by Black people came from a tangible of pathology and sought to examine the root cause of contemporary social problems, which to Monaghan was historically rooted in how American slavery had broken up Black families. The reason the Black Manosphere loved the document so much is because Monaghan blames Black women for emasculating Black men by being overemployed and overeducated. But the reality is, the Monaghan Report can and is interpreted in numerous ways, and 50 years after its publication, it's still contested on the cause and careers of Black inequality. A controversy that endured because it enlists competing explanation for African Americans despite ostensibly having equal civil rights experience of standard of living significantly lower than other Americans. Historian Daniel Geary noted in his book Beyond Civil Rights, The Monaghan Report and His Legacy argued that liberals and conservatives have used the report for different reasons. Liberals believe job and stabilized families can solve racial inequality, while conservatives believe in racial self-help and that black leaders should morally uplift blacks by inculcating family values. If you read the works of Tana Hasi Coates or George Will, you can see how these contested ideas play out in contemporary times. Despite what the Black Manosphere will tell you, political debates over the report were ephemeral. It wasn't this grand document upon publication. The controversy over the report was more significant than the report itself. It became public in August 1965, but by November, the Johnson administration had disowned it. It was only debated among intellectuals and political activists until the 1970s, and it didn't make a revival until the mid-1980s that continues till this day. Today, nobody can agree whether it's a conservative or liberal document because of its multiple and conflicting meetings. The report enduring salience was its maddening inconsistency on key issues regarding whether family instability was a primary cause or consequence of racial inequality, whether social pathologies were race or class specific, whether a patriarchal family structure was naturally superior or did minorities have to conform to mainstream nuclear family norms to advance, and other glaring questions. I point this out because the Black Manosphere often cite the report as definitive, but it endorses a conservative viewpoint that conservatives have endorsed for decades. And the majority of the things that you stated was in the Morningham report. And who were the individuals that fought against it and said that it was a bunch of bull, racist, just black people? And unlike what SKC claimed, few critics charged the report as racist. In fact, there were civil rights activists like Martin Luther King Jr. who praised it, but not for the reason the Black Manosphere does. Additionally, Monaghan had liberal, conservative, and black power critics and supporters. I leave everybody with this. Challenge everything you hear, even if you agree with it. There are just too many false teachers on YouTube and people who report themselves as experts on subject that they lack expertise in. It's easy to appear brilliant when folks around you are ignorant.